You're listening to the Inquisitive Red Podcast, the show that brings you philosophical ponderings of your life from a bird's eye view. Now, here's your host, Shah. Welcome back to the Inquisitive Rim Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. Thank you so much for joining me for the premiere of my second season. I am so grateful for the opportunity to continue to offer the podcast and offer what I hope are some interesting interviews for you all. This season, I'm going to be bringing you a mix of interviews as before, an eclectic group of people. I will, of course, continue to focus on artists and highlighting their work. Uh, This time, we'll be including musicians, uh, some surprises in store, uh, but also uh, we'll be looking at business as well. So entrepreneurs, uh, people who are, you know, sort of just starting out or they have been doing it for quite a while. It will be interesting to see their philosophy, their psychology around why they have chosen to work for themselves and run a business for themselves. So I do hope that you continue to stick around. Of course, really helpful feedback. If you can leave me a review, certainly just email me, let me know what you think. I am very, very grateful to continue to be able to offer to you these interviews. And I hope that you do find them uh, entertaining. Today, I'm really happy to have as the very first guest for season two, Ursula James. Ursula is a visiting teaching fellow at Oxford University Medical School and with her company, Thames Medical Lectures. She's lectured at most of the UK's medical schools, including Oxford and Cambridge. She was appointed visiting professor of clinical hypnosis at Robert Gordon University in 2013. Ursula is a very highly qualified and experienced clinical and medical hypnotherapist. And she's also a patron of Anxiety UK, which is an excellent charity in the UK, really helpful resources for people who suffer from anxiety. And also the National Center for Domestic Violence, the NCDV. She's also a foundation member of the Academy of Medical Educators and a member of the Women of the Future Network, which is an exclusive network of high potential, high achieving UK women. Ursula is an author and she's written several books, including a clinical hypnosis textbook. Her second book, You Can Be Amazing, Transform Your Life with Hypnosis, and You Can Think Yourself Thin, were published uh, in 2007, 2008. Her most recent book, The Source, A Manual of Everyday Magic, is out now. And that is uh, that will be in conjunction with the podcast that she's working on as well. Ursula is currently working with St. George's University of London on a virtual reality experience. Very exciting stuff. It's a stress management tool which has been designed to maximize relaxation and reduce tension. So she's going to talk about that today. This is innovative, and it also really does highlight the benefits of hypnosis. So I'm very interested to talk to her about that today. She continues to train doctors on the use and benefits of hypnotherapy that they can incorporate in their own practice. Ursula has a podcast, Hypno SOS offering many hypnosis sessions, which are really helpful for people who may be struggling, find themselves struggling with anxiety or or paranoia or stress. So they're all available. All the links will be in in the show notes. Today, we're going to discuss her works, her projects. So I'm really pleased to welcome Ursula to the podcast. Ursula, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm absolutely over the moon that you took the time to speak to me today. I've got so many questions, so many things I want to talk to you about. It's so lovely that you reached out. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, I want to start with your career uh, because you've done a lot of things, the counseling, the psychology, the hypnotherapy, and you even had a brief stint uh, with the Ministry of Defence. So Mm. What came first? What was the timeline like for you? What came first? Um, uh, After university, I sort of bumbled around being arty and uh, uh, working on a... I had a market stall selling 
selling things that I made. And um, after about a year, I thought, well, I really do need to sort of look at getting a proper job. And um, I, I, do you know, genuinely, even now, I wonder how it happened. I ended up working for the Ministry of Defence. Um, and I think it's partly because I'm half German. And at the time, Germany was kind of, you know, a bit of a hot potato. And, you know, I was I worked for them. And then the war came down and it was all sorts of all sorts of very exciting and interesting and awful. It was just awful because I was working, um, helping families who were moving abroad, um, doing support for them. And essentially, these were kids, you know. Kids with guns and anger issues and g- women who would got married very young and were taken away from their home. And so it, I, I ended up feeling that I was supporting a, a system that I didn't in any way agree with. Although they did teach me well, they taught me good skills. I learned hypnosis initially when I was with the Ministry of Defence. So that's, um, yes, it's quite, it's quite an unusual time of, of my life. Yeah, so interesting. And did that then lead to psychology, counselling? I I segued into that. I, I as I say, I had I did quite a lot of the study there, and then I continued it privately. Um, but it was one of those things. I trying to find something that genuinely worked, as opposed to a bit of a sticking plaster. So for me, I wanted something that gave people skills that they could use after the, you know, so that they, they didn't need me. So it was very much about teaching them a practical process, but also something that would work in the immediate to help them get over their problem. I didn't find many things that worked. And it was only when I went to a hypnotherapist myself because I smoked. And I and I, and I stopped and I thought, you know, that stuff I learned, it's pretty good, but I am... My level is 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 of, an, of ignorance is very high and of knowledge is very low, so I went and trained formally. And since then, it was it's like a drug, you know. As far as I was concerned, it was something that I think when you find something that works for you, it's actually very easy to convey that to other people. Mm-hmm. And one thing I found because I know there are many different schools of thought and many many different schools of training, but I think ultimately, regardless of what particular aspect you affiliate with if you are honest about it and and I mean honest about what doesn't work as well as what does work um, you're going to get a result because the honesty comes through yeah and with hypnotherapy there has to be honesty with the unconscious mind fantastic so we've got a similar story there then because I smoked and that's how I knew hypnotherapy worked I actually stopped smoking during my training in hypnotherapy. I was going to go for a break and I never picked up a cigarette again. We did. The- I, yeah. And when, and when it works, you just think, okay, it's worked for me. It, I know it works. It's kind of, you buy into that process. But I think as you, as you grow and develop and you learn different things about your, yourself, those things, um, I won't say bleed into your work, but they become part of the work because if you're always being honest about who you are, you change, you develop, uh, you work with the certain things that I won't work with, the certain things that I will work with. And I think you reach a point in your career when um, you get good at something without even trying because you see so many people of a particular type. For example, I, um, and this is a sort of classic rookie era, early in my career, I I took... um, a call from somebody who wanted to stop smoking. Yes, that's fine. Asked them all the usual questions, got them in for the session. What they hadn't mentioned was that they were profoundly deaf. So I had to work with that. And so I helped her stop smoking. And she happened to be a um, representative in uh, in court if somebody was in court who was deaf. So she, she did the the, the um, communication aspect. Mm-hmm. And of course, she told everybody that she knew and they were all deaf. So I ended up becoming quite expert in working with hypnosis for the deaf, which is not something that you'd necessarily associate with. Certainly not something I ever thought I would end up doing. But point being, you, as you well know, you don't choose what, what you end up specialising in. And what was it with you? Amazing stuff. 
for whatever reason, phobias, but I've never had one. So I get loads of phobia, you know, and I'm sure you found this in the hypnotherapy practice. It goes in stages. At some point, I'll get loads of smokers. Then I'll get loads of people who are phobic. And then I'll get loads of people for stress management. It seems to go in groups or phases. Well, it does. I mean, as you know, stress is contagious. And I, and I think if you, for example, have a phobia, you talk about it to other people who have phobias because you feel safe in that environment. If you let go of your phobia, you tell those people. So it is a cluster, essentially. Absolutely. And those referrals do come. You only need the one. You only need sort of one like you, you know, your example, and then they will just come. Definitely. They'll follow. I think, you know, pe people don't surf the internet and go, oh, I'll look for a hypnotherapist. They ask their friends. They Because obviously trust and rapport is such a massive part of whether you're going to be able to work with anybody in any form of therapy, but particularly in hypnosis. And if somebody you know has been to see someone and they feel comfortable with it, and I actually think working online is a benefit for most people because if their anxiety is going to a strange place to meet a strange person and the hassle of the tube or the train or whatever the journey might involve if they can do it in the in the safety and security of their own home and they have a button where they can just turn it off people feel more in control rather than less and that i find a really interesting knock-on effect mm -hmm. of people moving over <clears throat> to a much more technological uh, arena yes that took me a moment it was the counseling bit because I love being face to face, but we were forced to. And I would agree with you. And but it, it did take me a moment. It took me a moment to get used to it. I like to see, you know, I like to be in front of people, but things and times have changed. Yeah, and I yeah. and, and in, a, in a sense, it was at any time of crisis technology is accelerated and and who knew we would end up doing having a conversation like this but i do think it's also um an additional intimacy that we wouldn't have had you can go uh, and email someone and say hey can you be on my podcast or or can i talk to you and <clears throat> if they feel inclined they'll respond yes. you know whereas you didn't have that framework before it was a, it was so there there is a strange intimacy that comes from this this safety that we have of being in our little a little square. Yes, it is literally a square, a little square. I I teach at um I I teach doctors hypnosis. Yes. I also teach doctors how to use hypnosis for themselves. Okay. Uh, so to help them reduce their stress, to help them improve their performance, to help them improve their communication skills. Okay. And okay. I've taught at 15 medical schools around the UK and we're still teaching at Barts and we're still teaching at Nottingham yes I've got and, uh, now bearing in mind I've been doing that for almost 20 years um, the attitude of the students towards hypnosis is completely different to how it was when I first went in there oh, their attitude yeah. now is yep yeah, I get it it works bring it on teach it to me they are they want the research they want to know the clinical background but they now recognize hypnosis clinical hypnosis as uh, an appropriate tool and in the same way that we talked about things working for us stopping smoking for example when a medical student sees it working for them to help them reduce their stress with their examination nerves they are much more inclined to use it and teach it to patients, for example, for pain control or for stress management. So I'm, I'm quietly, over the years, I've been quietly teaching doctors about hypnosis and to understand it so that they're much more inclined to refer as well. And what I'm working on now at the moment is a project with St. George's Medical School in London, and it's using VR, virtual reality and hypnosis. And that is wild. That is a really incredible uh process because um all interesting pieces of of research and art and and science happen on the edges you know when, when two things kind of collide and for me I, i'm i'm a big techie so although i hadn't really known too much about vr so getting involved in that side of things and putting the hypnosis together with it you're creating a completely immersive experience that is absolutely real and is completely controlled by that individual. It is not therapy. 
It is not an excuse for not having therapy. It's not an alternative for therapy. But what it is, is it helps the individual um, get a mechanism of control, which if you are in pain or you are in um, a hospital environment or you are feeling anxious, any piece of control that you can be given makes a huge amount of difference. And that, along with the positive suggestions for change and improvement and focusing on the positive. So they're very short. They're, they're only sort of um, 10 minutes long at most. So it's, as I say, it's not a substitute for therapy, but it does give people something that they can, they can really use and, and embrace. It's early days, mm -hmm. but I'm finding it really, really interesting because even in the, in the initial piece of research that we did, the, the pilot study, there was only supposed to be 15 students, but they were bringing people along to try it. They were bringing their, their consultants, they were bringing their girlfriends, they were bringing psychologists. So, I mean, normally when you do a research project, you can't get people to get involved. We were kind of fighting them off at the door. So it was it just shows that A, there is a real need for it. And, and B, people are much more uh, open and accommodating. You know, they're, they're much more open to the idea of, of hypnosis as something that can really help and make a difference. So I, my aim is to just open the door a little bit wider because yeah. uh, it is terribly important that there are well-trained therapy practitioners out there uh, as opposed to people who do an online course or do a weekend and then just go out there and do it. And mm -hmm. even if you're already trained as a counsellor, you know that you need a bit more than than a few weekends to understand this process as, as, a, as an, even as an adjunct to the work that you're doing. Absolutely. Very innovative stuff there, really. I was quite uh, pleased, but also the research part, because that's always been so, one of my concerns about hypnotherapy. It's always, you know, for me, 26 years now being a hypnotherapist, every year we hear this hope, you know, there's going to be some more research, there's going to be and nothing yeah. more. Well, the, the fact is, until the way in which research is uh, is deemed to be acceptable changes, then there will be no advancement in the amount of research that's done out there, unfortunately, because you can't have a gold standard when a big part of what you do is completely subjective and dependent on, on the individual who who you're working with and on you. And that's why doing something that where the individual is removed from that process mm -hmm. means that we'll be able to move forward i hope fairly quickly in terms of getting some some research done that that will make people recognize that it is something that that works and can be accepted yes so i understand that this was recent in july this year is it ongoing still it's ongoing we've, we've done the pilot study and we're continuing to increase it and hopefully um possibly include an element for pain control and taking it onto the wards. So yeah, it's uh, it's happening. Research for me, it always takes longer than it than it than you want it to. You always want it yesterday, but to do it properly and do it within a um, um, uh, a hospital environment or, or a medical environment is really, really important because it doesn't matter how much work the psychologists do or the, the mental health care professionals do until the medical profession accepts it as a, as a, a component it's not going to move forward it's not going to be something that a doctor will be able to refer i mean you do get doctors referring i know i've taught enough of them and they're out there but it's not enough absolutely so this work is extraordinary and i'm going to put all the links in the show notes listeners so that you can have a look yourself and, you know, I ran across this note uh, from Milton Erickson, and I was looking at your body of work as an author. You've written eight books, um, and we're going to talk about one of them, or well, a couple of them in a moment. But Milton Erickson talked about uh, the goal, and he said, you know, if you want to, a goal without a date is just a dream, something like that, you know. And I thought, wow, that stuck out for me. Because we do have to set dates with our goals. And I wonder with all of your work, especially as an author, how do you get things done? What's your process? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I'm incredibly anal and I'm very organized and it all comes down to Excel spreadsheets. I hate to tell you this. 
<laughs> I say to myself, right, I will write 300 words a day. I will write no more because it's diminishing returns. It's better to have more inside you to come out the next day than to pour it all out and it, and it diminish. And I thought, okay, 300 words a day. And if I write for 30 days, that's X number of words. And, and that I literally do that. And I'll say, I'll give myself weekends off. So most things can get written in about four months. However, the research, for example, I um, my most recent book is called The Soul Midwife. And that took two and a half years research. Uh, but I wrote it in four months. Because by that time, everything was, the whole story was completely and entirely in place. And it just came out. Whereas some people will sit down and they'll write and they'll work it out as they go along. And I had a big map with a timeline going who goes where and how it all happens. So I mean, I'm incredibly resonant. It's my German side. I think, um, you know, I, I have to get the structure right. And then for me, the content falls into place much more neatly. Otherwise, it's just it's just all over the place. What is funny for me is when I write and I'm writing again now. Um, you start off with a, with an express intention of telling a particular type of story. And then halfway through, your characters will say to you, no, I don't do that. And and you, you find yourself taken somewhere else, which I think is quite interesting, actually, about this whole thing of of the different aspects of self and voices within you. And if you're a creative, and that includes creating hypnotherapy scripts, because you're immediately working with somebody's story. You know, you're, you're helping them rewrite their own life story in a way that will work for them. So I think in, in some ways, it's a very natural segue into writing books because I've done my 10,000 hours with sitting in front of people day after day after day after day and rewriting their story, um, you know, live without any planning, without any, you know, time to sit down and, and put pen to paper and work out what goes where. So, um, so yeah. So there is a process, yeah. And yeah. goal. Always, always. And for me, because um, I'm quite visual, I will decide on the book cover before it's written. So, for example, with the last book, I went to the British Library and I got permission to have the frontispiece of um, Christina Rossetti's book of poems. And it was it was drawn by her brother, by Rossetti. And it's it's a beautiful I don't even think I've got a copy of it here. It's a beautiful picture of, of two women and, and you don't know whether they're sleeping or, or whether they're, you don't know what's going on, but it's a beautiful sort of engraving. And, and I having that in my mind first, put the frame around the story for me. So for some people, you know, it might be an object. For some people, it might be a piece of music that they put on when they write. But for me, it's seeing the cover and of course, these days you can do mock-ups online as well. But just knowing what what the uh, what the picture was going to be like made it more real for me. So in my head, it was already real. I just had to write it. Interesting, because you're also an artist, and I know that you support artists. You support art. Do you think that art is born within us, or is it something we learn along the way? Do you think we're born? We're all artists. We all create our own life. We're all. You know, we all paint pictures of who we are. Uh, so we're all storytellers. And I defy any woman, and of course plenty of men, but I defy any woman not to paint because I see the most beautiful things they do to their faces. You know, putting on makeup and 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 blending and colours and, you know, we we are our, we are our own piece of art, really, when we walk around. Unfortunately, when people have got low self-esteem, they tend to put paint themselves in black and white or they try to paint themselves out of the picture. And for me, it's really important to embrace colour and embrace difference. And, and um, most of my stuff at the moment is wearable art because I think it's kind of important to for it to be very um, visible, mm. the, di the differences. And some people, they, ta they have tattoos or it's all about, you know, defining yourself and that's what we do when we create so I, I think it's innate but I do think unfortunately some people's lives erase that aspect mm -hmm. and it's important to re-engage with it 
I know that I'm not just talking about art, art therapy, but it's really important to re-engage with it as a language and a way of expressing yourselves and, and reconnecting, particularly because of the, the architecture of the brain. Peripheral nervous system and the language center, very closely linked. So, so if you teach a child the violin, their language skills are going to improve at that moment in time because of that. If you draw and you paint, your ability to express yourself more easily is is uh, is enhanced. And I just think it's so critical to keep that going. And that's why I still handwrite. I have mm-hmm. I have to say it's, it's a gift from my father. He taught me how to write beautifully. And I think handwriting is something that's getting lost. You know, the, the act of motor, you know, mo- fine motor movement. So it's really, really important for me. That's why I encourage people to to be creative and to draw and to paint and even, you know, a doodle a day, even if you never show it to anyone. I think it's really important to express your own creativity. A doodle a day. You said something really powerful there. Um, I don't want it to get lost. You said women either or anyone may even paint themselves out of the picture. Yeah. It's very powerful. And they do. And they're not even aware that they've done it. You know, even even in the way in which somebody carries themselves, you know, when you see somebody for a number of sessions, you, you watch their body change shape. You hear their voice change. You look at yeah, their eye contact changes. They are they are they are finding their space yeah. in the world, mm-hmm. and it's it just makes me really cross and sad and angry that it's still happening. You know, it's it, having somebody in your life at an early stage who is encouraging and it just says something nice. You know. How many times do you hear stories of people who say, I became a chemist because my chemistry teacher was nice to me or he was good or or she encouraged me? It It's, you know, seeds at the early stage of growth need the most nurture. And this is why I feel it's incredibly important to, um, to pay attention to kids, no matter how strange and wonderful they are. I, 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 it's, it's a funny thing. I don't have children, but children seem to like me. And I think it's because they see the child in me. Um, and I, and that's to do with honesty. Mm. And I think it, kids pick up if you are not being truthful, if you are not honest, or if you are in it, and they see it as danger and they will remove themselves from that situation. So, And we lose that as well. We lose that skill. That kind of gets talked out of us, the idea of intuition, the idea of, you know, picking things up, the idea of, having knowledge that other people don't have well i'm not a magician i'm just observing you know a lot of people aren't they don't see what's in front of them incredible never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now thank you for your support you make this podcast possible now back to the show is now you know in the source you talk a lot about uh having that another ursula by the way uh who i wonder if she was that for you as well on a spiritual level but also a, a teaching level perhaps a mentor in many ways i think uh, if you don't have someone who supports and and talks to you in a way that you you want to hear if you have intelligence you'll create it and I don't I don't mean intellectual capabilities. It's, it's kind of a, it's an intelligence that is innate. And we are not very good at listening to our own voices. We will listen to a voice from within that um, we read in a book or that reminds us of something else. It's about how whether you trust yourself or not and creating a, 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 an altar an entity, an identity that is other than you and giving that version of you a voice that is supportive and nurturing, you'll listen. Yes. And we just want to be heard, don't we? Uh, but we, we need to listen as well. I'm Before we talk about your podcast, because I want to get to that, um, I wanted to ask if you've ever had to fly above anything. Have you ever found that you've had to just rise above something in life. Does anything come to mind? 
Rise above is a bit is an interesting term. What do you mean by that? Or fly above is the phrase I like, just because I like the wren, the the, the little bird. You know, the, the yeah, the folklore of the wren, it was the smallest little bird and everybody thought it would be extinct. It was all for folklore. But the eagle came along, which is huge, and the wren, the wren defeated it. Mm-hmm. So it, it's just my metaphor for life, flying above, flying over something. And these are challenges in life that we face. I know we all have many. Uh, I think um, it's interesting you talk about flying above, and I would say flying within, because when I was finishing the source, um my mother was very ill my father was very ill my brother-in-law was very ill my aunt was dying and I was caring for all of them and I was finishing the proofs of the book and my aunt was was had died and it was just before I had to finish the book I had to get it out to the uh, to the publishers um before her funeral so she she was still here, you know, she, as far as I was concerned, she, she wasn't gone until the funeral, she wasn't gone. And I got such a sense of being overwhelmed by absolutely being responsible for everything that I, I did have a genuine consciousness of just lifting myself completely out of that space and going to Scotland to a bothy, uh, which it still is my safe space and it's tiny and it's one room and it's got very old walls and it's got uh, a, a sort of cauldron in a fireplace and, and, a, and a cat and a, and a little vegetable patch. And it's and it, I, I needed to take myself away because I felt as if I was disappearing in everybody else's needs. So, yes, that was a time uh, when I did that. And it was it was essential, and it and I think everybody should have a safe place. Mm-hmm. Everybody should have a place that they can go to in their mind where nothing can touch them. Yeah, and you write a lovely tribute as such to her in uh, the source as well. And um, what drew you to the idea of magic? Because the source is all about creating your own magic. Well. You know, we talk about voices and about being prepared to listen to things. Essentially, there is nothing in my book that isn't common knowledge. Mm -hmm. There is nothing in there that you couldn't find in different forms. But it's about the voice that delivers it. And as as a student of that voice, and in other words, having gone through that process, there is an element of integrity that comes in there as well. So I learned all of these different things at different periods of time in my life. And I felt it was time for an amalgamation um, and rituals and taking time and being connected to the earth are incredibly important in making anything happen. You know, whether you're, you're baking bread or whether you're writing a book, if you don't wait, it's not gonna work, is it? So and, and we are so now we're so geared to this sort of instantaneous ratification that going back to a much more natural and Gaia based and pagan process was for me essential. And it was almost like going back to the source, back to your roots there. And, but there is something that is cross all cultures because that book came out in I think it was. 12 different languages and nine different languages so it came out in russia and it came out in spain it came out in japan it came out in many languages isn't it yeah 2000 oh, interesting. Yeah. and yeah. every country published it as something different france published it as philosophy sweden published it as magical realism so it so depending on the culture of the country they picked on different aspects of the book so some within some cultures it was read as a story, within some cultures it was read as a as a as a manual, in some cultures it was read as a a, a sort of um a personal journey. So I found that really, really interesting. So the culture in which you the culture in which you are located dictates how you receive information of that kind. So I put all of that out, and as I say, in some ways. 
um, there's nothing in there that you couldn't learn elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But it was put together in such a way that everybody who read it could take something from it. Yeah. And that's universal, isn't it? Yeah. That's what art is meant to be. Because mm -hmm. even with your book on hypnosis, a lot of your writings, the practical, right? It's a teaching. But I believe there's an art to that as well. So we all, you know, observe and absorb information based upon ourselves, where we are, culture, yeah. everything else. But you're teaching, you're still teaching. But I think the only way you can make that voice heard as a teacher is to be a learner is to be a student you know if, if you are con if you continue to learn if you continue to strive if you continue to try and say i don't know which is an incredibly important and powerful thing to say i don't know i'll go and find out or i'll go and talk to somebody who does and i think it's in intrinsically female to 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 admit to saying Actually, I don't know the answer to that one. I, and I, I have a, an, an expression that I've used a lot lately, and it's it's going to come up in my next book. And it's, and I'm sure I'm quoting from somebody, but it, it's to say that incredible things happen if you don't care who gets the credit. Yeah, right. And a lot of women work underground, and the source is about working underground, about making things happen without standing in the middle of the room and going, I did that. That was me. Say good things. Because if your ego is strong enough, you don't need anybody to tell you you did something good. There's a, there's a joy. In, and, and magic is about making things happen in a secretive in a, in a secretive way where you don't have to put your ego front and center and boast about it. Mm. So I found I found it really pleasurable getting letters getting gifts getting emails from people who've read the source and are still reading it and say i had that as takeaway or i read it at a very low time in my life and it changed who i am and i went on to do this and and i can't think of anything more wonderful than touching somebody's life when you you never met them and you never will yeah absolutely i mean and speaking of energy and change because even einstein spoke about energy but your new podcast, which I love the title, Hypno SOS. I mean, that's ingenious because it really is a bit of an intervention. I listened to quite a few episodes and listeners, the episodes are roughly 15 minutes long at that. So you're not having to sit for hours listening to a hypnotherapy session. And in that amount of time, your energy shifts and changes. So can you just tell us a bit about Hypno SOS and how and why you decided to offer this amazing source to people for free on Apple and all streaming platforms? Uh, I started during COVID, I started doing live sessions um, and they got out of hand because so many people wanted to listen and were saying, look, I'm in the States and it's the middle of the night and what can I do? So I then shifted over to doing podcasts and the, the initial idea was to uh, for it to be for people who are frontline workers, so doctors, care workers, everybody who was who had to go out, bin men, everybody who had to go out and work, even though COVID was, was rife and, and people were genuinely terrified about what was going to happen. And I thought if it was 10 or 15 minutes long, you could you could just take yourself out, sit somewhere, or even lock yourself in the loo. And you and you had enough in there just to give you a little bit of a of a lift, a st and a stabilizer, something that that brought you back to to who you are. Because I think a lot of people who were out there working, they, they just they just disappeared in 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 everybody else's needs, and that I mean, it's 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 a mental health epidemic that hasn't yet hit us, and and it will. There's no question. And what was happening is because I did no publicity. What was happening is they were just sharing it with everyone. Um, so we've just hit a hundred thousand downloads, which is quite surprising. Congratulations, and the reviews are amazing, by the way. But Yes, go ahead. they are quite nice, aren't they? I try not to read them because, like any, um, I do have an ego, and like anybody else, I notice the ones that aren't good. <laughs> it's too, it's one of those things, isn't it? But um, I genuinely think that if 
And, and I, I also think it's incredibly important if you work with other people who are stressed. So if you are a therapist, before you go in for your sessions, just to center yourself, listening to something for 10 minutes where you just kind of you get something for you and it, and and energetically you you are lifted, you are filled, you are you are nourished because it's so easy to have a good technique and to forget to use it for yourself. So that's why that's why I put it out there. And as far as I'm concerned, um, I'm just really, really thrilled that people are listening and are benefiting. And yeah, it's um, it's quite a lot to put one out once a week. But hey, I am enjoying it. And as long as I'm enjoying it and people give me the feedback, then I'll keep doing it. It is an amazing source to have. Uh, and so you can. You know, for, for us who are trained in hypnotherapy, I will say it's all you need, really. You don't you don't even need to go to a hypnotherapist and sit for an hour and a half or anything. You can listen to one of those. You've got different ones. So see what you're drawn to. And they're all listed there, but they are fantastic. And, of course, you've got a hypnotherapy voice. So. <laughs> Thank you. It's very kind of everybody. I am. Um, I, as I say, it's not a substitute for therapy. It is very much about giving you control back, and it's about helping you get through the immediate. So things like better sleep, controlling anxiety, motivation, stress, and those are the four that keep coming up time and time again because those are the four that most people um, have the have the direst need for. Yes. Yes, as you say, it's not a substitute for therapy, but, you know, the SOS part, I find, is a bit of an intervention. You know, we can all get stressed out during the day for various reasons, and that's something you can easily go to without having to ring someone, make an appointment, and travel there or set up. And, and also, I, I've, I've discovered that listening to it um, is giving some people the confidence to go and have therapy. Oh. They're no longer so frightened of it. And, um, you know, particularly, interestingly, in, in places like Canada, which I don't know whether hypnosis is a particularly a big thing, I'm, I'm getting a lot of listeners from there saying, um, I didn't like the idea of hypnosis, but I'm going to try. So that's quite nice as well. It's um, it's encouraging. What I also appreciate is that you are an actual hypnotherapist. So what I'm finding on the Internet and on YouTube is a lot of recordings that are not hypnotherapy, but that are saying that they are. And hypnotherapy is a language. It's a way of formulating words. And only somebody who's trained will know how to use those words to affect change. And if you, if it's somebody else's words you're speaking, there's no integrity. If you don't understand what weight those words have, there's no value. And I and I like to think that I'm only ever talking to one person, mm -hmm. and that's why I think it's so interesting about podcasts. That's why they're quite intimate, mm -hmm. um, because you're you're only putting this into the ears of one person. That's the one person who who decides to listen. Yes. Now, also with the source, uh, are you doing a? Are you working on a podcast as well in connection with the source? I am. It's called Petrified Voices. Um, petrified as in terrified but petrified as in turned to stone because mm. mother shipton in mother shipton's oh, case yeah. there is a figurine of her and uh, there are totems all the way through gifts that people gave to her that were then covered in stone so i quite, I quite like the idea but it is a it is a conversation about, about um I'll, I'll be helping people work their way through the source. I'll be recording all of the trances so they don't have to do them for themselves. Um, and also I'll be explaining about why ritual is important, whatever form of ritual it might be. If your ritual is to, to put your clothes out the night before so that the next day you feel you're ready. Ritual, rituals got kind of lost. Um, and I'm a big fan of candles, as a lot of women are. I like the idea of, you know, lighting a candle, thinking about somebody um, whenever on the anniversary of um, somebody close to me's death. Um, my mother's anniversary is coming up on that anniversary. I will light a candle and I will get a photograph of her out and I will invite her to have dinner with me. And she will sit at the table, the photograph and the candle, and I will talk to her and I will tell her what I've been doing 
since last year. Ritual is so important, so important. And we can create our own. And no, but nobody, nobody can tell you whether it's right or wrong. Obviously, you're not doing any harm. That's the bottom line in all of these things. But ritual that 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 helps slow you down, that helps center you, that gives you a demarcation line between the working you and the home you. Really important. Um, a lot of people during COVID decided that was a glass of wine. Got a bit dangerous, you know. There are other things <laughs> you can do. Um, you know, alcohol became a, a major problem for yes. a lot of people during COVID. Indeed. There are other ways. Uh, there not, are indeed. Not that I'm against a glass of wine. I do like one, but a glass is fine. A bottle is not fine, as we all know. But um, yeah, having rituals that 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 are yours that work, putting on jewelry, whatever it might be, wearing your good stuff. That's fantastic. Yeah, now was it your handwriting in the source? I did, we were talking about handwriting, and there are some pages whereby I don't know if anybody no, you won't be able to see it, but that you've written is that the handwriting? Okay, okay. No, it's um, it's not my handwriting, but the okay. intention was that it that it looked like handwriting. Originally, um, actually, I wrote the book not on a computer. I wrote it in a book. Because for me, it was important to to to, to physically connect with it. Um, it also meant that I was less likely to self edit. All right. Okay. So that is that an important part? I've never written the book before. I've been trying to, but uh, is that an important part of the? Well, process? it's very easy when you write to think, "Oh, I can't say that because somebody might read it and get upset." And, and that somebody might be somebody close to me or that might be somebody I knew or that might be somebody who may become important to me in future. If you if you self-edit, you lose all your integrity. You've got to kind of let it flow with a certain aspect of stream of consciousness. Um, in, my la in my last book, which is a novel, uh, in The Soul Midwife, um, I did put a few people in there that I know. And... My husband, who also used to be an editor, <laughs> said, you can't leave their name in there because <laughs> that's, you know, you're going to get sued. Um, but it was a wonderful way of getting revenge on people who had irritated me. <laughs> I, did ch I did change their names. And the wonderful thing is, I know some of these people have read it, read it but still can't recognize themselves mm -hmm. because people don't see themselves as we see them ever. It, that is incredible. But you found a way to use that in art, really, to get that out and without using their name. And in many ways, for me, it's like an exorcism when you can do that. Oh, completely. Everybody has something that they, they'd like to get off their chest. Everybody has a conversation with someone that they never had. Everybody has uh, has a dialogue that they, that they would love to have with someone they're not going to meet. Write it. Make it real. You know, I, that's what I think why writing is so is so wonderful, because it's both incredibly personal and intimate, while at the same time, it, it's, it can be a game changer. Now, I want to talk about your involvement with Anxiety UK mm -hmm. and also domestic violence. I'm, yeah. I'm, patron of, I'm, I'm patron of Anxiety UK and of the National Centre for, for Domestic Violence. A lot of the work that I do is, as I mentioned before, um, unsaid, untold, and I prefer to keep it that way. Um, I don't see it as, as philanthropic. I see it as absolutely essential. Everybody who has uh, a skill, there are, there are always ways of using that skill to help other people. And I'm incredibly fortunate in that I've got therapeutic skills and I've got teaching skills, so I can, I can support the organisations in that way. But what I'm going to be doing over the next couple of years is creating an, a, um, an art space where people can buy merchandise and that fee goes directly to Anxiety UK as well. So kind of combining the two, the two sides of myself, as it were. So, yeah, I'm... Any involvement with um, with support and with charity feeds me. I feel, you know, it 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 it, it reminds me of why what we do as therapists is so important. Mm -hmm. 
and shouting about it is not part of the uh, not part of the agenda for me. I'm I'm just it's a privilege, really. Yes. Well, I always think though that some people, you know, people follow you may follow your work, may learn about your work and your involvement and get involved because it's you. And so in many ways, I think it does help. We do hear about people passing away and then finding out later on that they were helping this charity or that charity. But actually, some of us like to be inspired by those that we actually follow and like. And so... Well, the main thing for me was um, when I had my initial involvement with Anxiety UK, helping set up a process where hypnotherapy practitioners can volunteer, can be AUK supporters, so can support people who've got anxiety. And, you know, that there are many ways in which we hope to develop that. <clears throat> but the problem is, and always was, and has got worse, is financing it. Mm. You know, it until, <clears throat> until there is a, a real recognition of the epidemic that's about to hit us, the mental health crisis, mental health... Uh, charities and organisations are not supported, but yeah, um, it's it's interesting. Yes, yes, yeah, so there are lots of charities out there, but I I agree. Mental health at the moment and the NHS and many other uh, mental health organisations are struggling. Um, I know because I do advocacy work, so. It is very difficult for people. Some of the jobs as well, people aren't taking because they're very low paid. Absolutely. Well, that's the reason why Hypno SOS became important, so that people could actually access some helping, supporting the supporters, helping the helpers, whatever that term might be. Because if if those people aren't there, there is there is no NHS. Don't get me onto that subject because I'm you know it, I'm it's one of those things they should be paid a fortune people who work within the NHS. It makes me so angry, but you know, how do you make change happen? Difficult. And during the pandemic, uh, some GPs and some consultants were coming out of retirement simply because, and I know this firsthand, simply <laughs> because there wasn't enough, uh, there, there just weren't enough doctors available. And yeah. And the workload, the workload's immense, and it's it's an incredibly stressful situation, and hugely unappreciated. And it's like everything else; nobody thinks about a fire until your house is on fire. Absolutely. So it's important, listeners, if you want to reach out to charities and get help, there is help out there, and Anxiety UK is one. Now, with domestic violence, that increased. Uh, statistics show, studies show over the period of the pandemic. Uh, you know, I haven't read enough about how or why. My uh, professional guess is that the stress, uh, it just amplified the problems that yeah. were already there. Putting, putting people in a small space with a fearful situation going on outside will amplify any problem that's already occurring. And it's just terrifying, really. I mean, at least now, police do listen and they do take it seriously in, in, in cases of, of domestic violence. You go back, you go back even 10 years, that situation wasn't the same. So it is improving, but it is like so many, so many of our, uh, our resources, our frontline resources, they're stretched. So they have to they have to now decide what is important or not important. And it's, you know, massively stressful for them and tragic in some instances for the people, people involved. So, yeah, it's um, again, these it's it, it's not easy to support an organization that you don't want to believe should exist. That's, but that's, what, that's why I feel it's so important. Mm. It's a really good point as well, but thank goodness they, they do exist so that people can get the help uh, out there. And we want to encourage, as therapists, we always encourage people uh, because I'm sure all, all of us as therapists have had to perhaps deal with a client who is in that situation. And so we always, not to tell people what to do, but we always want to encourage them to yes. seek help. Having, if you are a therapist and, and, 
having and badging on your site that the National Centre for Domestic Violence exists, mm. talking to charities that are referral a agencies, making sure that, that the people who come to your site know that there is additional help out there for them is actually quite important. Very important, yes. Having the right sort of links on the site helps. Very good point. Yes. Now, just a couple of quick questions before we wind up. Around hypnotherapy, do you think it's important that hypnotherapists have supervision? I think it is, but I just recently heard that a big register out there is thinking about removing that aspect. Why? <laughs> um, I think you know the answer to that one. I think it's incredibly important. Um, if at least have some sort of peer support, but supervision is incredibly important because especially as especially when you've been doing it for a long time i'm not saying that people become arrogant but they can become a little bit habituated to doing things in a certain way and people you know the population out there changes and the way in which they relate to therapy changes so it's important to, it's important to to keep studying and it's important to keep aware of where you are because you know as well as I do that in, in a therapeutic profession, there are a large number of people who shouldn't be therapists, who got into it because they need therapy and they decided to access it themselves by teaching themselves the skills and then going out there and working with other people. Thankfully, it's a self-limiting group because after two years, they, they, they're gone. They, they, they've got what they needed out of the process and it's gone but in those two years they can still do damage so I do get quite I get quite angry it is important that, that good clinical supervision takes place it's important that CPD continual professional development takes place and it's important that you you communicate with your peers and 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 share experiences and perhaps even talk about different ways of doing things so so continuing to have that community is an, is an essential part of not just hypnotherapy, but of therapy in general, I feel. Absolutely. We can be self-regulating, but there is no replacement for reflection back. And th there's just no, and, and what makes hypnotherapy different from counseling, whereby you must have supervision and you must do CPD? If we're trying to regulate hypnotherapy, if we want to be seen as serious, then we have to continue. That's my view anyway, with, yes, with processes that have been shown to help, to help us reflect. To help. And as you say, we sometimes we can't, if we're practicing for a long time, we can't see the forest for the trees. We just go, it's the next go to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, 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 you know, it's lovely to talk to you and know that there are, people out there who are still striving, still learning and, and broadening the reach of the work that they do because um, the work that you do is a reflection of who you are as an individual and we are not one dimensional. You can have a very spiritual aspect, you can have a very practical aspect, you can have a very art based aspect or whatever it might be. All those are elements of you, but depending on, on, on the, the, the discipline that you employ, you have to recognize that you will always bring in aspects of it. There will always be a certain amount of bleed. And because that's people are coming to you for help, they're not just coming to the process. Exactly that. Precisely. And people do be, can become quite upset when I turn them away. <laughs> On the consultation, they're very confused. <laughs> well, I don't have to actually you know, take you on. I don't think it's the right therapy. I don't think it's the right time. Whatever the... But they're quite shocked. But you know something? I think that's that's to me that's kind of a key question when when you're when um, you are in practice. Who am I prepared not to see, or who am I not prepared to see? And there are some practitioners who say, "Oh no, I'll see anybody. I'll just it's the problem that's important." No, it bloody isn't. What's important is that you, if you are working holistically. You're not working with a problem. Your client is at the center of everything you do. Well, you know, preaching yeah, no, the you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely right. Yes. And we can't, we're not magicians. We can't, you know, do everything and see everyone. And, and when somebody says, make me better, well, I can't make you do anything. 
Yes. You know, fix me. Give yeah. me a guarantee. No, I can't give you a guarantee because I don't know how you'll respond. I, I think there are. it's quite interesting to me there are a certain set of questions that people ask. And, and you know when somebody asks more than four questions, they are already setting themselves up for failure because these challenges are so geared around where's the get out clause for me. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And it, it is important, you know, to be able to say no to those people and and always to be able to pass them on to somebody. Yes, always, always, um, you know, signpost them elsewhere. Exactly, because it may be me. There may be a reason. It may be to or, do with me. Or they can just listen to a podcast, reflect, <laughs> and then go to somebody else. Yes, exactly <laughs> that. So, Ursula, thank you so much. We've got one last thing. We put a fork in it, as I say, for our random question. I've got a little bowl here. Some of it's a bit philosophical, but I'm just going to pick one. Um, okay. Oh, <laughs> if you had to walk away from one technology in your life, what would it be? Car. Oh, wow. Okay. Without a shadow of a doubt, it would be the car. Interesting. Yeah, you, you didn't really have to think about that. No. Because when you no longer have a car, you you connect with nature in a completely different way, whether you're walking or you're cycling. Uh, being in a car, you're in a bubble, and, well, it's a piece of technology that kills a lot of other people. It kills the planet. I, I would... I would happily say goodbye to the car. If we didn't have cars anymore, our communities would be smaller. We would be better connected. We wouldn't be worrying about the fuel crisis. Mm -hmm. um, yes, of course, you know, we, we there there is a requirement for vehicles to carry food around, whatever. But but ch I think it would be it would be the the biggest transformational change if we walked away from our car. Incredible! Now that's fantastic, wonderful stuff. Yes. Thank you once again. Uh, is there anything else you want to add? No, except to say you're delightful. Keep doing oh, what you're doing. Thank you so much. And you are as well. Guys, please go to Ursula's podcast and all the links to her website and everything else will be in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.